Hey, welcome. We're we're back with another math hangout. This one's going to be on calculus one, first principles, the delta method, and derivatives. If I don't sound super enthused, it's not having to do anything with this hangout or math. It's just my back is really, really bothering today because I pulled it out the other day, and I'm just trying to, to get my mind off that. So I'm going to try to be a little more lively. I need to got some coffee, but before we get started, um, EO here likes to make likes to would like to make an addendum or a correction. Uh, to something that he said earlier. So let's just get out of the way and, and so he could pay his penance to the math gods. Um, Eo, what, what was the mistake that you made? During the last hangout, at the very end, when we were doing the epsilon de delta proof for the quadratic limit, at one point during the inequality, I wanted the inequality to be true so badly that I ended up, well, pretending it was true. I had a nagging doubt, thanks to Ovid, I corrected it, and there is a much less elegant proof because none of those proofs can be elegant. You have to grind them out. But if you're interested in the unlikely event that anyone listening is interested, contact me and we can talk about it all day. Thanks, Steve. Yep, and I also had a, I'll, I'll, I'll pay my penance as well. I actually had a really silly math there where I tried to somehow distribute an exponent across a, a, a negative sign rather than do a binomial uh expansion of it i don't know what the hell i was thinking um so so yeah that was somebody corrected me on that as well so hey you know what we do correct each other we all make mistakes we're not all landing um when it comes to math so anyways um like i said we're going to just jump into this uh if you got questions live chat go ahead and, and give us to us and by the way uh anybody can come in i did put the link in the the great debate community link uh eim that we have set up for it and i did put it in the community because I'm running this hangout, and I trust myself. I don't trust any of my managers <laughs> not to follow the rules. No, I'm just kidding. But I, I, I'm going to just put it aside the little thing where you don't put it in the GDC. I know I'm paying attention here, and I'm not going to let anybody in that's going to do damage. And if we get sniped, eh, whatever. But uh, I'm going to try to pay attention for that. But let's just, let's just jump into this. So you guys are really raring to go. I can see we got Red Eye out there in the live chat going, yay, calculus. Uh, yeah. All right, so let's share my screen here. Move this over here. Okay, so let me know if you can see this on the outside chat, guys. Uh, I can make it a little larger. I don't want to make it too large. That's probably about as big enough. So let me know on the outside chat if you can see that uh, when it comes up. There's a few minute or a few second delay here. And if you can hear me. I haven't even done a sound check. Red Eye, can you hear me out there? Wave into the audience. Hello. Eo, can you check the live chat? I think Red Eye died on me. He's in the live chat, but I don't see anyone else writing anything. All right. Uh, hang on. Let me just. Okay, I can see you. Okay. All right. Well, you going to hear me, though? Yeah, I can hear you in the uh, outside. All right. Good enough. All right. So let's start from the derivative first principles. And. We, we talked about the other day how we found the slope of a curve at any value for x. We, we, we actually had a very simple formula um, where the slope is the change of y over change of x, basically rise over run. Remember that? The change of the uh, y2 minus y1 over change of y x2 minus x1, over x1. So basically delta y over delta x. Now, using this method, this first principles, we're just going to substitute that delta x and let h represent that. Okay. So when you see the the formula for the the the, the first principles formula, the limit that we're using, that's what we're going to be using x rather than delta x. Now you can use either one. Um, the delta x method or the delta method is just another way to to represent a small change um, from one position to another on the curve. And I'll show you what we mean by that. How we're taking we're basically taking various lines. That are that are secant lines, or um, I, will they be secant lines, or just will they be secant chords lines. too? We, okay, we so secant, the secant lines okay. all the way to the tangent. Yeah. Okay, so we're taking the secant lines that intersect the function at two points, and we're moving that one point on the function. We're keeping one fixed, and we're moving the other one, and we're taking the next tangent line and the next tangent line until it gets closer and closer to our desired point. And we'll be showing you how how that's actually done. So we're going to be substituting x for delta x, and we're going to be substituting y. For f of x again, when we ever say function of x, x is the argument to the function, and y is the the uh, dependent variable. So, what we say is an ordered pair is a coordinate on our Cartesian coordinate system that x and y that is in the form of x, 
comma y. So x tells you how to how to find the x where on the x axis we're going, right? If we're at zero on the x, we're we're basically you know right there in the middle of the Cartesian where the y intersects. If we say y zero, we're literally zero zero. We're at the origin, right? So we've all had points. We all I think everybody probably understands how to how to get a, a point based upon this this type of notation. So I can express that point instead of saying like x equals zero, y equals zero to be the origin, I can express it as y comma f, uh, oops, you know what, that's f, should be f of x, not f of y. Uh, let me fix this, see? I, I made a mistake there. No, that's not it. Uh, it's, hang on. it's like what you might want to say capital P equals x comma f of x, otherwise it might look like piece of function of x and f of x. But it's fine. No one's going to Yeah, care. okay. So so we're going to represent... Um, God damn. Did, did I, I do the same thing? There we go. Um, so we're going to represent the, the point as, as uh, x comma f, f of x. Why did this not... Wh what am I doing here? Why is this not showing here? Uh, don't worry. It's just a typo. Just put x there. Yeah, but I don't like typos. I'm, I'm ADD. There we go. Now it's fixed. Okay. If, if I made those two, you really should have put capital P equals that, not P of... P of where? So you see where the P is? This one? Capital P? Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would just put equals that X comma F of X. Um, well, this, this okay. is how it's represented when, uh, what I was taking it from, and I'll show you the okay. source. That's fine. Okay. So basically, the, pair, the, 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 the coordinate is, is represented at point P by X, F of X, right? Where F of X is equal to Y. So I'm just changing that. I'm substituting. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to take a small change from x so x plus some value and we're going to be looking at it from x plus some value and where y is represented by x plus some value right so as i change the value of x i'm changing the location of the function i'm going to get a, a y value for because y is obviously the dependent variable so in the example that we're going to be using and, and let me kind of show you the picture of what we're going to be doing here um, before we get too much further this is the the this is where i taught most of this from because i thought it was very simple so as you can see here, right, this is what we want to do. We want to find the time rate of change. Let me uh, see if I can make this bigger here. We want to find the time rate of change at this particular point on a specific function, any function, right? We want to find how fast instantaneously this point is changing. And the way we're going to be doing that is by, by going this method here. And what, see how this, see how they noted it here? What this is saying is, as we change the value of x, we add this h to it, which is the x, part of the x component, right? We are going to have to go up a little bit here, which we're going to call g. And this point that, rep that represents the change of x plus the function of x plus h will be represented here. Now, this line that's produced here between these two points has a particular slope. This slope is an approximation to this line that we want because we want the tangent line to the point p which is the instantaneous velocity at that point of the function by by getting this point here q or moving closer and closer to this point what's going to happen this line here is going to start getting more vertical it's going to change the slope it's going to more approximate the slope we're looking for that's what the delta x method is or First principles. It is using that type of formula to approximate closer and closer and closer by taking a limit as h approaches zero, which is going to be pretty much the point. But as h approaches zero, this line here is going to more approximate this line here. And I'm gonna sh and I actually and I actually showed it this way too. And I thought this was a little more easier to maybe just kind of see it this way. Um, Da, da, da. Yeah, it is easier to see that way. So you can draw, you can draw a sequence yeah. between zero and one, Steve, and then. And then right. So what I what I did was we what I did was. Broadcast somebody, at um. Oh shit! Okay, one sec, one sec. Let me give you guys mods because I can't yeah. do three things at once. Hey, we got uh, um Justin in here. I haven't seen him in a while. Yeah. Oh, I don't want to present. I'm going to show him. Uh, one sec. Uh. Just pass me mods. I'll I'll present. Yeah, I got you. I got you. Mods, mods going out. Mods going out. Hey, Justin, you get mods too. Whatever. You want to learn about math? Go for it, man. No, no it's not my subject. 
Well, we get to learn here, so I don't want to learn. I don't want to learn it. You want to learn? Come on, come on, man! This is educational stuff. It, no, it is, but this is, yeah. Take one for the team, buddy. Come on, just just sit in here, so I can say that I had you know some younger creationists actually come in and want to learn math for a change. It has nothing to do with creation. <laughs> well, yeah, well, you're right. It really doesn't. Math is math, right? So no, uh, your, your choice. Okay, whatever, man. It's I'm super. Creation. I'm just super right brain, and. Uh, you know, my logic on, on this doesn't work on the math side. Of, you know. Well, you know, we offered. We're offering here, man, so. Okay. Uh, uh, you want to give it a shot? You want to try? Because if we explain it to you, then it's like, hey, we feel I, – I mean, I, I, I'm preacher to the choir when it comes to, like, challenges to EO. EO do, teaches this stuff. He's, you know, got it down to an art form. He's exceptionally, exceptionally good at it. So, so I'm just I'm just going through the motions. By the way, I should – what was I should note to everybody, I'm not a mathematician. I'm completely a lay person. I'm going back years on this. But I enjoy this kind of stuff somewhat, and I enjoy talking about it. So that's the only reason why I give these things, uh, these little presentations. If you like them, great. If you don't, don't watch. <laughs> so, so Steve, can I give a big picture yeah, view and we can in incorporate yeah. Justin here? So why Steve is doing this is the following. Everybody knows how to find the slope of a straight line. It's simply rise over run, and they have constant slopes. For example, y equals 3x plus 2. The slope is just 3. Now, one of the reasons calculus was invented was how do we find the slope of the curve at a particular point? Now, what Steve is doing, he's going to draw successive secant lines that it touches the point. And the Latin for touch is tangiari, which is, and so we're going to find the slope of the tangent line. So, Justin, what we're going to do is you pick any point you want, Justin. Oh, what did you say? One, one? Is that the point you well, let's, let's start. Yeah, let's start with the base. <laughs> I, I, I picked point one, one. I, I actually started with uh, four, two, but I thought I, I actually redid it. And I did it as one, one because a little bit easier to see, I think. And by the way, Red Eye says thanks for the visuals. They really help. Um, I, I think so, too, Red Eye. I like visuals. I think visuals make a huge amount of difference. So let me show you what we're doing on this function. This is a simple x squared. This is a parabola. This is one of the, the most basic, about the basic, uh, quadratic you're going to get because it's just x squared uh, the vertex is at the origin it's it's not inverted or or twisted or you know it's just a normal freaking parabola so i want to know what is the time rate of change how fast is this function changing at this particular point one one now i could take a a line okay and i just took a line and i just put it straight through a bisecting well not really bisecting but it's a, it's a secant here and I just picked four points on that line to kind of gauge the line and said, okay, at this point, I'm approximating the function that I want, or excuse me, the tangent of line I, I want, which is going to be the one right at that point. Now, obviously, this was nowhere near what we're looking for, right? It's a really bad approximation. Um, this actually, anybody know what the slope of this is? I do, but it's not you, Theo. But uh, well, you, I can't see it, Steve. You can't see it? Can you drink? Yeah, I can, I can see it's a straight line. Doesn't have any yeah. slope. It's it's a it's a horizontal line. So what's 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 the slope oh, of a horizontal? What's the what's the slope of any horizontal line? Think about it's it. One. No. Or is it zero? Zero. So I, th I thought it was. Up, if I have it up and down, it's zero. If it's uh, no, it's up and down. It's one. undefined. It's undefined. Oh, that's what it was. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah you go. So if it's straightly vertical, if it's on it's uh, orthogonal to the x-axis, meaning perpendicular, it's undefined. So so this is just a slope of zero. That doesn't tell us anything, right? So we go to another approximation. What I did was I slid this point down from negative uh, one, uh, one point, which is right here, and I move it down to the origin, zero, zero. Now I have another tangential line. This tangential line is a little bit closer than what we're looking for, right? You can actually see that it's getting closer to what we're looking for. By the way, this is the line we're looking for. Let me make this a black color. Maybe it'll help. Let's see. Can you see it now, Eo? Oops. No. Can you see that, Eo? But you slipped. You meant to say another secant line. You haven't see you can't see the tangent line? No, mm -hmm. I can see. It's fine. It's beautiful. Uh, okay. What I'm is awesome. tangent. You meant another secant line. Yeah, I added another secant line here to, to approximate the tangent line that I'm looking for. So this slope right here, I believe, I think this was, I think I, I calculated, I think it's a slope of two. Um, and then again, we're actually looking for this particular one. And I actually, I'm giving away the formula for this line. Don't worry about that. But this is actually the formula. And I'll show you guys how to get this formula when we're done or near the end. But this is the actual line, the tangential line we're looking for at point P here. And again, if you think of these points right here and it, right here, this is Q. It's getting closer and closer. And as it, Q gets closer to 
this point here, my approximation is getting closer and closer. That's the gist of basically what we're trying to do here, okay, using first principles. So um, let, me, let me move this out of the way because I already showed you this. Okay, so we are going to do, we're going to actually do, do the derivative of x squared based upon um, first principles. Now, we all know by now the derivative of x squared is 2x. I think basically everybody and their brother doesn't even know Calc knows that. They may not know why, but they do understand the derivative of x squared is 2x. Now, we can apply the power rule to that, obviously. We all pretty much know the power rule by now, too, right? Anybody remember? Oh. Anybody? I remember. Okay, the power rule is we subtract 1 from the exponent. We actually we move the coefficient. We move the exponent to the coefficient, subtract one from the exponent. So x squared, we move the exponent down to the coefficient, right? So it's two x, and then subtract one from two, leaving one, which is just x. So the derivative of x squared is two x. That's using the power rule, and we will we will get into explaining why that is using the power rule using EO's notes because I was not going to type all this stuff in. No, it's just not the way I'm feeling right now. So we're going to cheat and just show you a picture about why that proof is, works. But, 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 but let's, let's actually find out using first principle why that power rule works for this. Why it actually x squared, why the derivative is actually 2x. So if I pick, if I, excuse me, um, oh, this was for the, um, my, 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 I, I wanted to show you real quick. The other line that I have, that other secant line, it was a slope too right here. But, um, I don't think we can ignore that. So let's just kind of skip past that. I don't know why I concluded that. But what we're doing again, since the slope is delta y over delta x, and as you saw, as q, that one point, moves closer to p, that line that pq forms, right, approximates the tangent at p. Okay, so that yes, pq should have a line over here uh, on top of it. It would really kind of be correct. So EO, I, I'm aware of that. I just I wasn't sure how to put a bar over that or, or a vaniculum. But um, as Q, Q approaches P and H approaches zero, we have a tangent line at point P where Q equals P. All this is saying, as you think about it, as that point Q approaches P, the point we're looking for, right, as the, the H, right, which is the delta X, if you remember, goes to zero, we now have the tangent line at P that we're looking for when Q is equal to P. Is everybody, everybody kind of getting that so far? So the closer we're moving Q to P, the closer we get to the approximation to the actual tangent line we're looking for. Sound good? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we all know the slope formula, right? Y2 minus Y1 over X squared minus X1, which is the same thing as saying delta Y over delta X. And we're just going to change those, those variable names, or as, as Ronnie likes to say, variables. Right? He likes to say verit veritables. Um, G over H. So we're going to call delta X H and delta Y G. Now, again, if you look at the the, the thing that I showed you for, all, first is all we're having is a change of X, which is on the X axis, right? So it's a change of, of X, which is H, and a change of the Y axis, which is G. And remember, G is a change of the Y axis. From here, this line here to up here, is changing on the y. So this is the g. So all I'm doing is saying g is equal to the delta y, h is equal to the delta x. Okay, so. Dun, dun, dun. Since we are, no g is equal to the delta y, we can also say that g is equal to y2 minus y1. And y2, we can set to f the function of x plus h and y1 be an f of x. Now, this is where people start kind of losing their mind. And I think you could probably agree. When they first start learning about this, stuff, they're, they're going, what does, this, what does this mean? But it's really not complicated. It's not. All this is saying is that since y is normally the f of x, we all agree with that, right? y is the dependent variable of the independent variable x. I'm just setting that to be y1. But my y2, my second position, is just f of x plus that h that I added to x, right? So now I have y2 minus y1, but y2 is f of x plus that h difference minus my initial y1, which is f of x, which is just y. Totally makes sense there, Drag? Shit, I was muted, yeah. So then we got the uh, slope formula. Let's see, do, 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 since the... I don't know who else is in here, but I'm not sure else it's like, like ping on. 
um, to ask. Let me see if I can get the window back up. There we go. Oh, it's just you two. So come on, guys. You want to join in? I, I want to ask you guys questions. Uh, so come on, Kelso. The, the link is, you know, off the GDC. Yeah, so, so let me walk right you through now. this again because you, you, I don't want you to be confused here because this is critical. If you don't get this, nothing's going to make sense after this. I am just substituting what we know into other things. I am just saying, look, it, y of 2 minus y or 1. You totally agree that's a change of y, right? Uh -huh. Delta y. We're just going to call that g. And since g is the change of y, the second position, the second y is equal to just f of x, which is our normal y, plus h. I'm just adding h to that x. That's it. If that's the case, then g is actually equal to f x minus h minus f of x. Okay, That gives you g over h equals f h plus x minus f of x over h. Now, when you combine all this and you say, OK, if I let h go to 0 as approaches 0 and, and q, that point q approaches p, then g of h, which is just my slope, right? Well, at point P is what I'm looking for. So the derivative, remember this notation, right? Mm -hmm. Dy over dx. Leibniz, Leibniz notation equals the limit as h approaches 0 of f plus h plus x minus f of x over h. And again, this is just putting these two things together. It's just saying f of x is my normal y, y1. Think of this f of x here, right? Like You guys can't see my pointer, can you? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, so as f of x here... This is my y1. That's all I'm doing. I'm just putting y1 here, and y2 is f of x plus h. So it's y plus that h, or excuse me, that x plus that h value. That's it. But people get confused as they see this, and they think, wait a minute. If f h goes to 0, I'm going to be dividing by 0 here. That's that not what's happening, okay? You, that's not how you actually evaluate this. You can't. You remember, we, can, we that's why I had the limit thing first, right? You can't divide by 0. So that'll, act, that'll actually factor out as we go on. So don't let that throw you. Don't go, oh, I don't understand this because h goes to 0. If h is 0, it's undefined. No, because that h will actually be factored out as we've done before in order to simplify limits where we can actually take the limit with not having that blow up and the universe be destroyed. So if I may, Steve, a couple of things. Yeah. Is that what good so far, you? You're, you're fine. Uh, just a little okay. typographical stuff. You, you could move that subtraction smoothly. A couple of points. Steve did well to highlight and this is what's called the definition of the derivative, what Steve wrote there in blue ink. And it's really important because what we mean by first principles is find the derivative using the definition. Now, we'll, we'll learn all these powerful tools later, and Steve has highlighted some of these with the Taylor series. But this is, again, foundations. This is the definition of the derivative. And I want to point out, it's not at all clear that the derivative always exists for every function, but we'll save that for a rainy podcast day. Sorry, go ahead. So, but, but so far, so good? You're doing great, Steve. All right. Yeah, this actually, this the reason I highlighted this in blue, whenever you see blue, I'm kind of using definitions or something that's very critical. This right here is the definition of a derivative. Okay, so this is a, this is important because this is the foundation of, of all calculus using derivatives, basically. So we're going to kind of use, utilize this formula, but I want to make sure everybody gets this down. I mean, because it looks kind of complicated, but drag, do, do you see what we're doing here? We're just taking y2 minus y1, and then moving you know approaching uh that that tangent line at p as h goes to zero that's all this is really saying oh steve you might want to hit uh, for those in the chat it's it's hard the first time you see this maybe really highlight that x plus h minus x um results they might be wondering why aren't there two terms in the denominator because the x is canceled maybe hit that if you didn't already uh where, where are we talking about so you did a great job putting it as y2 minus y1 or yep. x2 minus x1. So maybe oh, 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 okay. It should be, yeah, I got you. Okay, yeah. Yeah, because you're, the, you're uh, fine. I'm just saying in case anyone needs clarification. Okay, um, let's see here. Two, two, two. Okay, so the differentiation from the first principle, which is the delta method, right? That's what they, when you hear delta method, it is the instantaneous rate of change with x with res uh, y with respect to x. This is where this is the whole shebang right here. Because whenever you take calculus, you can see it written any of these different ways. They mean the exact same thing. And this EO is why I hate math. Because 
there's so many different ways of representing something that means the exact same thing, right? But so, but let's look what this is saying. This is what the first part is actually what we just already discovered is our derivative definition. Um, it is actually taking the limit as h approaches zero from the the point Q as approaches point P. This can also be represented by delta x, right? Because we we initially said way up here, if you remember. That h, h equals delta x, right? So this is why we have h on the bottom here. Delta y is g, delta x is h. So we can actually represent the same exact thing as h by sticking in delta, thus the delta method. But it's more symbology, right? It, it, it takes, it's more the right two things here than one h. And this is actually a capital, capital delta, right? You might also see it in lowercase. And a lowercase delta is this little symbol here. So you might see it written this way. Don't don't worry. They, they, these all mean the exact same thing. Okay, but whatever course you take, you might have it written differently. Don't freak out. So you can have H, delta X, capital, or delta X, um, lowercase. And maybe EO might know the history of why they use one or the other that you might want to go into. I have no idea, to be honest with you. Oh, except you mean to, delta? Except to, except to confuse poor calculus students. Because I think math teachers like to do that. The capital del the delta yeah. versus, yeah. You know what's funny? This is fascinating. Did you know that the partial derivative sign is sometimes called at lead, which is the which is the opposite of delta? Um, I'll just point out, and Steve, this is your area. They use delta all the time in physics, right? Delta v, you know, the how much what is it lift per? Yeah, how much energy it takes. Go ahead, take take off with of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, delta delta for, for like rockets. You t you're talking about the the, the the instantaneous change of velocity. You know, yeah, I'm talking about the fuel, how much energy it takes per, per kilogram. Yeah, mass. well, as, if I remember correctly, as you go, I don't know anything about rocket science. I'm not, I mean, Reg is the guy for that. But I remember uh, rockets, as they go up, they actually get more efficient because they have less fuel, um, in, you know, they're less heavier, so they get more efficient. But your change of velocity has to be proportional to how, what your directory you're trying to go to, to put in orbital, um, your, your orbit. But I, yeah, I don't remember the formulas for any of that. No, that's all kinematics, dude. I, I'll just point out, physicists love deltas and mathematicians prefer the H's, but go ahead, Steve. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, that's a fair enough point. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, we, we when, you, when you're talking about physics, you do usually more use delta. Uh, for example, like um, acceleration, right? There's no such thing as, as decelerate in physics. You never decelerate. You have negative acceleration. And when you're taking the difference between acceleration between two two time periods that's the delta right that's a you're taking a delta of the acceleration you don't you know you don't look at it from h you look at it from delta um a right so you got a good point there but i don't know why they use capital and not capital and i didn't know the name of the partial differential um symbol and by the way i could never write that symbol properly it always looks more like a, um the symbol for um uh sigma for uh uh, for, for statistics, I can't ever get that symbol right. It's like a, it's like an at symbol, only like weirder. What's it called? Right, I, can, I, it's called. It's just the partial. We just call it the partial, but it kind of looks like a delta the opposite way. The the lowercase delta. Yeah, By yeah, way, similar. Drake, it's similar. Drake, is it me or does Steve time out sometimes? Can you hear him consistently? Drake, is Drake there? He fell. He already fell asleep. Oh, sorry. Keep mute myself. Am I cutting out to the live chat? Steve's off. We're earlier. Okay, no, that is I okay. Hear you now. Okay, well, let me know if I cut out. I, I seem to be fine on my end. Um, okay, but, let's dive in. Okay, so, so again, this is this, everything on blue. Memorize because this is this is that's critical. You have Those, to know this. Yeah, that notation that you, that we ended up producing the dy over dx equals limit of as h goes to zero. Um, F of uh, x plus h minus f of h over eight. F f of x minus uh, over eight. Ugh. That's what I'm familiar with, and that's this what we hear in the first one. Yeah, yeah, that first. Yeah, yeah, that's that's, that's that common. But yeah. in in higher math, you, you, they kind of like make things difficult, so they use this stuff. Whatever. I'm just giving EO shit because I hate higher maths. But anyways, so let's let's actually let's actually do this. So, and by the way, I'm not even lying. I I am actually thrilled that I actually remember this stuff. Um, I for the longest time never bothered with ever really getting back into this stuff and the fact that I can actually remember it and be able to at least explain it I'm cool with that I think it's pretty cool I'm actually entertaining myself so I want to throw that out there because I don't give myself props enough but I, I actually kind of do know this stuff so whatever you know that's cool right you know um, again if Ronnie wants to come in explaining this stuff he's more than welcome to 
Oh God, no! Just, just saying. I mean, it's throwing it out there. We'll, we'll, <laughs> so I've why did we lose it. Justin? What happened? He didn't like the content. I'm telling you, um, I've noticed something with with certain people. It, um, they don't want to to learn. So even even if I had no idea what was going on, I'd probably sit and go, "Okay, I, I'd take a try to take a listen." But yeah, I've sat in uh, Christian hangouts and just listened to them talk about um, not the Trinity, but the 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 Diune or whatever or whatever whatever triune, the, 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 the Triune and tri, Diune natures. There, yeah. there actually there actually is a Diune if I remember correctly. Yeah, I, I've I've sat in for like an hour and a half and just listened to it just because I didn't I didn't agree with any shit they were saying. But I sat and listened to it because I thought it was interesting. You know. Oh, you we should get Edgar to something. explain this, Drag. No. <laughs> if he if he's in the chat, I want him to explain this. That that would be entertaining. I legitimately would like to see him explain this shit. <laughs> Steve, I wanted Justin to stay because I would have been so polite until the very end. And I would have said, at what point did we consult our worldview when doing these calculations? There we go. Yeah, exactly. What what worldview changes our calculations? Um. Uh, it's it's funny that you say that because I wanted Justin to stay because if we can explain to him, we can explain to anybody. And that's one of the <laughs> critical things of any instructor, right? We've all done instructions. You've done tutoring. I've done tutoring and training. One thing that you gauged upon, did the person understand what you were saying? Yep. So, so hey, by the way, Kenny Rose, live chat, dude. I got to get with you later on. Loved your loved your stuff last night. Pastor really Dr. Mr. Kenny Rhodes, yeah. PhD. We're going to get with you later, my friend. That was just, you were superb. I, I give you kudos. Um, I, I, I just told you that what you're getting yourself in for. But he says, do you have a Zeta method for us non-math heads? No, I do not. <laughs> but maybe he might. You're going to have to struggle through it, Dr. Mr. Kenny Pastor, Dr. PhD Rhodes. Sorry. And by the way, he went to a school that's actually accredited. So he does have a full, full PhD. He's legit. Do you want to I'm clarify that, Steve? Because that came up what? earlier. Maybe just clarify What's that? that for the audience. What? That he went to an accredited school. I yeah, was... you know, his school is accredited. He he did not go to like um, you know, Ken Hovind's Bible college and or got a mail order PhD. Up, up his, the trailer his, in the middle of Arizona. Yeah, his, his legit the, his, his, his legit study. I mean, he got I mean, he is a um, adjunct scholar to reasons to believe. They don't just accept people like you know, Ken Hovind or, or something like that. So, and I've actually looked at some of his stuff. I mean, yeah, he knows what the hell he's talking about way more than I'll ever get into, but I just found it really entertaining that he was just pointing out to G man. He didn't know, he didn't understand the concepts of heresy or orthodoxy or heterodoxy. And this is a guy that's supposed to be preaching to people. And I know we're really off topic, but Hey, welcome to the great big community. Oh, this actually, is what we do. <laughs> so I should, I should uh, <laughs> put the link in the chat for, uh, for Kenny where he was preaching about adultery. Actually, oh, Adam, yeah. go ahead and I'll, I'll put that in the chat. And so, uh, Kenny, I want you to see something that G-Man was putting out there three years ago. And um, you can he did it, correct that, though, didn't he? He, he did, but it took okay. him weeks. It took him literally weeks of to get Christian's that corrected. Because in the meantime, he called every other person who talked to him a heretic. Uh -huh. He called every other person an apostate. And that's, that's where I remembered this from because he's done this before. Well, tell so, Kenny what he was teaching. Oh no! I yeah, I we're want, off topic because we. We're, I want I want, I want Kenny to watch it for himself. I want just I must put a link. Hold on, let me find it. Uh, but go ahead, Steve, with, with right. this. That's the great thing about the great this. debate community. We incorporate a lot of stuff, right? I mean, it's just you know, I love tangents. Okay, so let's go back on topic here. And Kenny, you're welcome to join and learn some math too. Even though you you're, you're way ahead of us, probably you I'm sure you had all this stuff. Kenny's had logic, so he knows. So this. you love tangents, Steve. That's what a segue. What a segue. Yeah, t exactly. What a segue. Um, tangents. I get it. Now, we're going to find the derivative of, of f of x using these first principles. Now, when we do this, you'll see why we just like the power rule, because it's so much easier, obviously, because this is a pain in the ass. So we're going to start with the function f of x. OK, no big deal. Uh, do I need to make this any bigger? I think so. Let me just. OK. Uh, the link to get in is in the um, GDC if you want to come in, Kenny. So. So starting with this, f of x equals f uh, x squared. Now, that is y1, correct? y2, we need to find out. y of 2 would be x, f, f of x plus h, which is basically what we do is we take x of h and stick it in where x is, okay? So now I have an equation here of x plus h squared because I'm just taking x and adding h to it, right? So you just you take x plus h and you stick it in the variable, <laughs> done. I'm not going to do the expansion here because we've already done this before, but we know when we take a binomial expansion of x plus h squared, we're going to end up with x squared plus 2h, uh, 2xh plus h squared. I think everybody understands that, right? By now, we've already been over that. Yeah, okay. 
because I mean, I'll do the binomial exp expansion, but it's basically, you know, it's X times X, then you have uh, X uh, times uh, a, uh, H, and then H times X, and H times H. So this is what we end up with. So going back to our original thing of our derivative uh, definition, right? The dy dx is equal to the limit of H, H goes to zero of this formula. I'm just sticking in stuff now. That's all I'm doing. So remember, I'm basically saying y2 minus y1. Keep that in your head, and it'll save you a lot of heartache. It is y2 minus y1. That's what I'm doing. So here's the formula for y2, and here's the formula for y1. It's basically my functions, right? So I'm taking this, the point that this comes up with minus the point that this comes up with for y, right? Because y is equal to x squared. So whatever value I have for x, I get a y out of it, right? This is what I'm saying. I'm just saying y2 minus y1. Okay. Now, what happens when you put when you put these together? What happens to the x squares here? And I put the brackets in for a reason. Um, I the reason I added these is because I think this way it shows the cat the the way to group them that this is y2 minus y1. You can remove these brackets. Okay. You you, you won't even see them in, in probably when you're doing this in, in actual class, but this is how I like to group things because I think it's more visually appealing that I'm seeing now that is y2 minus y1. So what happens here to the x squares? Anybody? Drag, what happens to the x squares? Uh, it looks like they cancel out because you they have a cancel negative. cancel out. Yeah, negative x squared and regular x squared. They cancel out. So I am left with, and, and by the way, you, you, I, I think, and I don't know the reason for this besides just standard practice, but generally you always start with the highest exponents and work your way down. Okay. That's what I was taught. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to, we're going to rearrange this formula and basically you cancel out X squared. And again, if I had a middle pen, I'd just go cross cross and put a little X and arrow arrow. What is the little line with an arrow going through it is how I do it. So I, I'm going to rearrange it. I put the X squared on this side to the left and I'm going to end up with the limit of H approaches zero X squared plus two X H over H. Now, now we learned, if you remember, I can't take the limit by just sticking zero in there because what happens? Everything goes to zero, and then you're going to get something that's undefined. And the universe blows up, and we don't like the universe to blow up. That's bad. So this, th what we do is we just simplify this. And I actually, I actually broke this down more so than what you know what, what I would normally done, just because I just want to show you. But and, and I even prove it to you why this is. But what we do is we break it down like this. I can actually just say. That h squared, I, I actually put it in wolf from here to show you, because some people have a hard time looking at this. But these terms can actually be rewritten with just h squared over x, or excuse me, h squared over h plus two x square, two uh, x h over h. Right? I'm just taking the, I'm just taking the denominator and I'm separating the terms. Remember, in algebra, terms are separated by pluses and minuses, and I'm just separating these two terms, h squared plus two x h, and I'm just showing them individually. They're equal to each other. How does this evaluate? Evaluates as true, right? It's so, all the same base. Yeah. It's the same base. Exactly. Bingo. You've got it. Same base. That's all I'm doing here. So, I would have looked at that, and I would have tried to divide so, everything this, by that. This is where, sorry, yeah, folks. Precision exactly language drag. is important here. Oh, sorry. Same denominator. Base refers to exponents. Sorry, guys. Base, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Yes, right. Same, same denominator. Fuck. Same denominator base. How about that? <laughs> no, it's you know the same same denominator, and that denominator. that is something that needs to be highlighted. When I look at that, and I go, okay, I want to simplify that, and I see everything up top uh, has been multiplied at some point by an h. So I know that since my denominator is an h, I can take an h out of everything up there. So the h squared, I can take an h from that, and the two x h, I can take an h from there. So I'll be left with um, h plus two x if I take that h away. Okay, let's find out. Um, and you're, you're exactly right on here. This this point right here is where most people have a lot of confusion. They're like, oh, what do I what do I do to 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 get rid of this h on the bottom, right? Because I can't take the limit as it goes to zero if I, my denominator is undefined. Well, I do exactly what we did here, right? And you're right. We cancel these out, right? Wait. Uh, you know what? I made a mistake here. Uh, is that right? Because it'll be you just yeah, you'll have it. Steve. You just H. 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 Yeah. yeah, it'll just be H. Yeah, see, but see, I got my own mistake, right? Because I was like, wait a minute, that's yeah. not right. So, and then you plug in the, the 
H thing. You make H go to zero, and then all you'll be left with is a two X. Exactly. So so here I have H squared with what what with H in the denominator. You just subtract one from the top, right? You're just left with H, right? And again, this works with any exponent. If I have X cubed and I divide it by H, I have X squared, right? I'm just subtracting one H from top and bottom, exactly. So same thing here. I'm just subtracting one H from top and bottom. They cancel out. I'm left with two X. So Exactly right, Drag. What happens when I now I can take the derivative, and this is this is why exactly why I did limits first, though, right? Does it make sense why I wanted to go over limits before we went over anything else? Because this probably wouldn't have made sense a couple weeks ago before we went over limits, right? Yeah, it just it just wouldn't have because you would have been like, well, how do I take the limit of this? So now, as you write, you take the a limit of h goes to zero. This goes away here. What am I left with? The derivative of x squared equals 2x. Yay. Okay. Everybody, everybody got that? We good in the live chat? Isn't that awesome? You guys Yay. are not impressed by this. Okay. Whatever. <laughs> Enthusiasm. EO's impressed because he's a math dude. All right. So let's try a different one. Drag. Since you're oh, see, great job. Can we scroll up for a second? Um, yeah. An important point that um, students – and what you did is great. I, I would have just backed out the age, but what you did is fine. I want to point out if you can scroll up one more level. One more? There we go. Do you see where it says the limit is h close to zero of h squared plus 2xh divided by h? Can everyone see that? Unfortunately, many, many students whose background is a little bit weak will pretend they can just cancel out the h and be left with um, uh, h plus 2x. One of the terms, you have to have a strong grasp of factoring or do what Steve did and uh, rewrite them over a common denominator. So, yeah, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't cancel out top and bottom across a negative sign or plus sign. You've got to separate them out like I did. Or factor it out, but yeah. Or factor it out, right. Um, and by the way, this is just, the way I did it, this is just one way to do it. There, 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 you might have, you might actually have to write it out each and every time. I just figured out the, the thing for f of x and f of h of x this way, right, and then stuck it in. But there are other ways you could, you could conceivably work it out, but... This, I think this shows it the, the easiest, but let's try it using a little more complicated formula, right? Now, excuse me. Now, Drag, I know you could probably by now look at the look at this formula and your equation and say, yeah, I, I, I know the derivative. I can do it in my head. With yeah, the, I can do, yeah, use the power rule, yeah. Use the power rule. So, <laughs> That's really so you already right. know the answer ahead of time, which we'd expect to get, right? Yeah. Okay, so let's, let's see if, if we can do it using... Um, um, the, the, the first principles though. Okay. So I'm studying F of X, right? With two X squared plus three X. I'm finding out F of X plus H and all, and, and all I'm doing now again, right? Is I'm taking X plus H and I'm sticking it where X in is. So I'm, instead of having two X squared, I have two H plus X squared and I stick it in here. Right. So let me go, let me just cover this up. So we go step by step here. Do you see how I get to this, this formula here? Well, let me look at it for just a second. I'm just, I'm just taking x of h, right? I'm just putting it where I where's an x is, and I'm putting it's, like, it's a quantity, right? So, if I have two x, Steve, squared, let me go ahead. Let me give you a plug. Um, if anyone's confused at this point, please check out Steve's video on order of operations because that's going to play a key role here in a second. Another reason why I did a video on order of operations. Order of operations is critical. It, which, by the way, I messed up the other day on one equation because I didn't pay attention to the order of operations. So it is it is critical. You know these things. So do you understand how I got this particular equation, though? I'm just putting h plus x into uh, where x is. Yep. OK, so now, this yeah. quantity, think of this quantity as, 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 as x. I'm saying x equals x plus h. And I'm just sticking it in there, because I'm just adding so, h to the x. See, if I may, when I teach my students pre-calculus, one of the things I teach them about functional evaluation Drag, if you could imagine a, a picture of a red cherry. So we have x equals 2x squared plus 3x, right? So imagine now a red cherry. If I say f of red cherry, that means that wherever I see x on the right-hand side, I have to put a red cherry. No matter what it is, the rule is f of x equals 2x squared plus 3x. So if I change the argument, what's inside the parentheses, then I have to change it on the right-hand side too. Sorry, Steve, go ahead. Okay. So mm -hmm. this is where it starts getting fun. Binomial expansion of the x plus h, right? We, we actually have to we have to do the exponent first. Would you agree? We can't distribute the 2 until we take the exponent because what's has a high order of operations? Yeah, the x, uh, well, there's parentheses, then exponents. Okay. But there's nothing to do in the parentheses, right? I can't simplify yeah, the can't do anything in there. Yeah, right, so, so next you go to exponent. Okay. So when I take the expansion, I end up with, with this. I, this time I actually showed 
XH plus SXH, just because I wanted to show you the entire expansion. But what happens when you combine those, right? You get 2XH, right? So I'm actually going to just rewrite that real quick. 2XH, where'd you get four? Oh, okay. I was, I was like, where'd you get four? And I know you, I see you multiplied everything out and foiled. Yeah, foil. Okay, so first, first, outer, inner, last. So I'm just going to combine those terms. So the binomial expansion for this, I'm just ending up with x squared plus 2xh plus xh squared. And here, there's nothing to do with it, right? I, I, I'm, not, I'm not distributing it yet. I will. But I just wanted to get that exponent out of the way just to show you guys, okay? Because I like, when I, when I was doing these, I like to do things step by step. And the reason I do that is because I get lost really easy. Right, even even in nuke school, if I didn't do things step by step, I got lost. I, I wanted to make sure each step I knew what was going on, so I can go back and find an error if I needed to. Right? Yeah. Okay. So next step. Now I'm going to distribute, and this is a simple distribution. This is called distribution of multiplication over addition. Okay. And so I'm just basically two x squared, two two times two x h. I'm just doing the same thing over here. Three times x plus three times h. So I'm ending up with this big old long formula now. We good to go on that? So this is now equal to this. Steve, you, uh, let's hit the fact that you distributed the three across the x plus h. Students often forget that. So it's three x plus three h as you've written. Yeah. Okay. So now we can put it in here. Now when we set this up here, drag, what do you think the f x plus h minus f uh, h minus f of x is going to look like the y2 minus y1 what do you think it's going to look like it's going to look like this entire formula here minus this right mm -hmm. okay that's exactly what it is this entire formula here i'm sticking in here for this f x plus h because that's what Go it on. is and f of x which is this so i'm just putting this entire thing into here and i'm just substituting f of x what we already know the f of x is this formula here so i end up with this old lot big old long formula okay we good to go? On. On. I'm looking at it. It's, it, it's, it's kind of hard sometimes when you go, okay, um, I'm looking at this, but it's really simple. All I'm doing is I'm, I'm just figuring out what this is, f x plus h, based upon what I know, f of x, and I'm just using our derivative formula, and I'm just sticking in what we've calculated this to be, right? We figured this out to be, and I'm just putting it in this derivative. The de definition of derivative. I'm just sticking this whole thing in right here. Uh -huh. Okay. And I end up with this. So my original um, formula that was like right here is this. And I end up with this big old long formula minus the original formula, which is f of x or 2x squared plus 3x. So I'm, I'm getting all these different terms in here. Okay. Is that making sense? Yeah. I, was, I, was, I just need time to look over it Yeah, well, make sure that I understood it. Yeah. Think about this way, right? Look, see the f of x up here where my, my pointer's at? Mm -hmm. I don't know why I'm, I'm actually pointing at the fucking screen with my finger like you can see that. Yeah, no, see? I see your pointer. No, yeah, I, no, I'm actually, no, no, literally, I'm pointing with my finger as oh. if you can see my finger. Why are you doing that? Because I'm a fucking idiot. What do you want? Okay, so, by the way, we curse in the GDC. Sorry, kids, if you ever watched this. Um, this is for teenagers. Um, so, so f of x, right? If you look that's going to be the original problem, yeah, for f of x. That's, that's easy enough. This yeah. is right here, and so the same thing, f, x plus h, this is the original, you know, we're just sticking in x plus h for x, and then we're factoring it all out, we get all this. Again, y2 minus y1. Okay, and okay. we've already figured out what that is uh, from the previous uh, problem above. Okay, yeah. And I that's why you. I did that way. You. Instead of having to write everything over and over and over again, I think this, the, the, to me, is a very easy way of doing it. That way you, you, kind of, you kind of figure out the stuff beforehand, then you can stick it in the derivative, uh, the first principle derivative uh, definition. So now we just do cancellations, right? X squared cancels with X squared, right? We got a 3X cancels with a 3X over here, and we left with this, 4XH plus 2H squared plus 3H. Now again, the, I'm just going to rearrange this because we always put the exponent to, uh, to the left-hand side, right? The highest exponent down. So I'm this. I only left it this way because I want to show you. We're just canceling out this first term. We're just canceling out this term, we're, and we're and we're canceling out this term. Um, so and this term. So basically, we're left with four h x. We're left with two x h squared, and we're left with this three h over here. Okay. And I'm just rearranging them. That's all I've done. But now we run into a problem again. We can't. We can't take the h goes to zero because the universe blows up. We don't want that. So we have to figure out a way to simplify this, right? 
And I just did the same thing as I did before. I just split up the terms, factor them with a common denominator, right? And now I can actually simplify this. I can just say, okay, well, 2h uh, squared my, divided by h is just 2h, right? I'm just reducing it by 1. I can cancel out the h's here. I'm left with 4x. I can cancel out the h's here. I'm left with 3. And now, Drag, what happens when I take the, the h goes to 0? What goes away? Oh, uh, looks like all those H's went away. Except, actually, hold on, wait. Do, 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 do. That. Okay, if yeah, if you if you take H goes to zero now, then that two uh two H goes away. This two H goes away, and what am I left yeah. with? Uh four X plus three. Yeah, that's what I have inside. And what did you say the derivative was using the power rule? Four X plus three. I put there it inside earlier. It yeah. works. Okay. Now let me ask you before we get into the power rule stuff. So I I got to do the point slope formula. Um, I'm going to show you how to get that in a second here. But before we, we go further, which would you think would be easier to use if you come across this this equation here, 2x squared plus 3x? What do you think is easier to use, the power rule to go through each step that I just did right, right now? Fucking power rule. That's why people there do you it. Go. <laughs> like, oh, God, that's that's what I'm going to hate is trying to do that stupid formula again when I can do the power rules. And it takes But, but they want you to learn the basics. The right? yeah, they want you yeah. to learn where that power rule comes from. Drag. You both are from the military, right? So think of – First principles as basic training. You have to pass basic training. That's yeah. right. But afterwards, you at least you know why the power rule works. But yeah. but people, you have to build upon principles, right? If we just, if they just say, look, use the power rule, you're never going to understand why the power rule works, and that's going to be a deficit in your learning. And that's what I think I see happening with a lot of people in the community is they jump so far ahead, they they mix out on the basics, and they don't know why things are the way they are. Don't we see that a lot with the clown car posse? Oh, yeah. They'll fix okay. something that they think is, is special and go, oh, look at that. It's like, no, actually, you actually need to understand what you're getting at here, and the conclusion you're drawing is wrong. You'd understand it more if you would have started from the bottom and worked your way up with your knowledge. But exactly. Trying to work backwards and explain all this shit's a pain in the ass. And, and it leads to confusion with them. Okay, so, so here we've solved it. DY, so if you see this dy dx, 2x squared plus 3x on the left-hand side, this is why you can do this problem in your head. And so when people say, well, how do you do calculus in your head? This, this, is, this is how you do it. Well, again, this is a very old – not all problems are like the this, FX both. All you need to do is a power rule. If you need to do the chain rule, you probably yeah. – well, very few people can do the chain rule in their head. I'll say very, that. Very, very yeah. different. And we will, get over, we, get, we will get into the chain rule as well. Um, I, have, I touched on it before, but I need, to, I need to go more in depth in the chain rule because when you start doing integrations and integration by substitution and all this other stuff, it's an integral part of all that. So, but, so the reason we have the chain rule is, for example, this is a very simple function. It's the linear combination – of two polynomials. The reason we need the chain rule is because we'll look at more complicated functions that involve composition of functions. So the chains refer to the compositions of the different functions. But go ahead. Uh, Steve, can I just make a major comment here? Yeah, yeah. So what we've done is Steve referenced that parabola y equals x squared. Now he's referencing another problem, y equals 2x squared plus 3x. And what Steve has done very neatly has given you a formula for the slope of any tangent line to the parabola at any point x. And namely, if you want to find the slope of the tangent line, you simply put in x. For example, if x is 2, the slope is 4 times 2, which is 8, plus 3 is 11. Let me... Um, Did I say that too quickly? Did everyone get that? No, 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 not all, but I, I just want to just... Uh, the, the, uh, well, I was going to put the slope in, in there, but... Uh, we, we should point this out, Drake. Um, Steve is doing this out of the goodness of his heart. He's not getting views for this. He's not getting money for this. Not by any means. <laughs> He's just simply no. doing this as a pure form of altruism. And, you know, Steve takes a lot of maligning, uh, most of it justified, but this is most pure of it. altruism. Yeah. I, I no, think, I, well, yeah. you know, I, 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 like I said, I'm very self-deprivating, but I do realize that um, you know, I do know a little bit more than people give me credit for. Just a little. But yeah. in the, in the, from the clown car posse, at least. You know, I think that... The educated people in the GDC know that I'm not a moron, but uh, I, I do I do have self doubts. Of course, it's been a lot of years, but I do think to myself, yeah, I, I mean, I got the basics of this stuff down, and, and that's more than than any of the CCP does. But anyways, this is what the the, the graph actually looks like. So this is what that formula actually looks like. The two x squared plus three x will look like this, and you'll see that the apex goes down here, and here's where it crosses the origin. Here's the roots. Remember, the roots are where it crosses the x, right? And it since we found out the derivative to be 4x plus um, three. 3, that's going to be the, the, the line that represents the derivative of that function. And as, and as 
as EO astutely points out, I could put in any value for X, I'll get a Y value of where the, 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 the slope is for a particular point on that graph, on that function. So if I say, okay, at X equals zero, right? At X equals zero, well, what's zero times four? Zero plus three. Boom. Here you go. This is what I'm at. This time, then so the time that that that's that's how you get this line, right? I mean, I could basically use this line to calculate any point um, by the by that formula. Okay, that's the time rate of change of that of that function. Does that make kind of kind of make sense? Yeah. Okay. It's good visual uh, good visual representation, actually. Yeah, because the time rate of change at zero, right? This right here. Is going to be uh, going to be three. Yeah. Okay. So let's let's see if I can move this over here, and let's see if I can actually show you why that actually works that way. Uh, blah blah blah. Uh, okay. Finding the slope formula. Here's gonna here, hopefully it doesn't get too tricky here, but bear with me here. Oh, I remember these problems. Yeah. These these can be kind of a, a, a these can get confusing really quickly. Not gonna lie. There was something at the end that I kept forgetting to do, and I don't remember what it was, but I, it was something that you're supposed to. I'll, I'll remember it later. All right, let's see. Let's see if we can walk it through. Steve, it. If I may, though, for for beginners, where it gets confusing is all you need is the x value. The y value actually can distract you, so don't pay attention to it. All you yeah, need is that, the x value. Yeah, that's a good point. We only when we're doing this, you're going to find out we only really give a shit about the x value. Okay, that's 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 completely true. So given the dy dx of x, x squared. We already know that's 2x, right? So uh, we don't have to factor that anymore. Um, it, you might have a problem that says, okay, you know, find the derivative of x squared, then find the slope at p1, comma 1, right? That, that's how you're normally going to get some of these problems. It's going to ask you to find the derivative first of some function. But I'm going to assume that we already know the derivative of the function. Save us a lot of time. Okay, we already know the derivative of x squared. So let's find the slope at p1, 1, okay? And if again, going back to our our thing here, I want to know the derivative of this point, right? I want to know this black line. I, I want to know what the time rate of change is at P, and that's here. So what we're doing, okay. So I'm going to set F of X as X squared. We automatically know that, again, I'm changing notation. And I don't know what the rule on that is. Maybe EO maybe can kind of uh, guide me on that. Um, but, I'm, I'm kind of changing from one notation to another. Is that kind of frowned upon? But you're I, I like it that way. Completely allowed to that. Tomato, tomato. It's okay. all the same. No problem. Thank, thank you. Okay. I, I just find it a lot easier. I like, I like expressing um, dy dx this way, and I like, like showing the f prime this way. I just, I just find it to be conceptually easier for me. Hey, whatever works for you. Right? And if I, if I can just stand on my soapbox for a second, this is why so many people are drawn to mathematics because. Some of the lively discussions you have in the great debate community never happen in math. Like nobody ever goes to war about different notations, and everyone understands what you mean. So it's great. Sorry. Except when it comes to implicit uh, um, multiplication, implicit multiplication by juxtaposition. There's still argument on that. Oh, I'll take your word for it. Well, some people argue that implicit multiplication by juxtaposition has a high order of precedence, and in standard order, order operations, it doesn't. So, but whatever. So. The f prime of x, we automatically know is 2x. Okay, we, we're just going to give you that. So I want to know at, at x equals 1, right, was that point p, the slope of the tangent line is equal to the derivative at 1, right? Because, again, what is the derivative? It's the tangent line at that point, right? So I want to know the slope of the tangent line at p or if x equals 1. Same thing. These are all saying the exact same thing. So the derivative of the argument of one, when I stick one into X, when the formula is two X, what do I get? What's the derivative? What's the slope of that tangent line at that point? You just put a one in there. So one times X is two, right? So the, so two is the slope of the tangent line at that point. Okay. So I, I now have the slope of the tangent line at one. Does that make sense to you drag? I found out the slope. Here I've got the I've got the derivative of the of the function. I've given you that. You didn't have to figure that out. But I want to know what the what the time rate of change is at that point. So I just put one into x at, mm -hmm. at point x or point one. Yeah. Well, one times x or two is just two. So the slope of the tangent line is two. And what I'm showing you here again, uh, let me get rid of this line. I'm just saying that this line here is has a slope of two. That's it. Okay. Too easy. Oh, what was that? Okay, that was weird. All right. You, you see that? 
You get that? Yeah, no, no, your, your screen okay. kind of did something funny. Anyway, go ahead. Okay. So I'm just kind of moving things around here so I can keep track of live the, chat right here. We'll use the X veritable. We'll yeah, uh, look at the one. link link to get in. I actually put in the the G plus if you want to come in. Okay, so now, now that I have that, I want to know what the Y is, the Y1, right? The Y1 is basically where we started from, right? It's just my initial um, function with, with X equals 1. Well, that's this formula, X squared. So I'm just sticking 1 into that. And, of course, 1 squared is 1. So I'm just trying to find out this formula. I want to find out, find out all the different arguments or some all the different terms in this particular formula is what I'm kind of looking for. Are you going to drive the point slope formula now, Steve? Is that what you're doing? No. Well, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm showing how to, derive, to find the point slope formula for, for, for any particular function. But I know in here now, I know, I know the slope, right? I get, let, me, let me rearrange this first. So let me rearrange this. This is my point slope formula. We all, we've all seen this before. I'm just rearranging it. I'm just taking um, the denominator. I'm moving it over here, and I'm bring, you know, bringing this down. So that's all I'm doing. I'm just rearranging it. Now, when I start putting in numbers, right? I, I can put in the number for m. What's the m? And m is the slope. And the remember, remember the, the, one of the first things we went over. This is why I want to go over linear equations first. Linear equations. The formula for that is mx plus b, right? Y equals mx plus b. Remember that? There's a reason why we went over this yep. stuff first, because I mean, I I, I think that a lot of stuff more makes sense if you if you remember. Or go sort of the basics. So a linear equation is more simplistic than in the quadratic or a parabola. So this is one of the reasons why we went with linear equations. So the formula for y equals mx plus b, m is always the slope. But I know the slope now because the slope is the slope of the tangent line. So I can just stick in two there. Okay. I also know y1, right? And how do I calculate y1? Well, y1 is just one in the function of f of x. And I also know um uh x1 because i'm that's where i'm starting from one right yep right so i could i get i get I, I could put all these different numbers in right and i'm just going to distribute these out so two times x minus two y minus one eh. let me move this over here and so i end up with y equals 2x plus one because i i, I basically there's two variables in here left right but i put in all the numbers i i know so given, given this particular function, x squared, all I need to do is find the derivative. I need to find this point at p, 1, 1. Now remember, we only care about 1 here. We only care about the x. y here makes no difference. So remember, that's kind of important. We only, find, we only give a shit about the, the x. And the reason being is we only end up here with the x, right? We, we're looking for y, but we only end up with the x. We, we have one x unknown. But here's the formula. 2x plus 1. And if you look very carefully on this particular graph, look what look what happened here. At this point here, oh, let me get rid of this tangent line. I, at this point tangent line, I, I started with one line, which had a slope of 0. I had another a tangent line that was getting closer, right? But the, when I actually reached that point, here was what the tangent line looked like. And I just created this tangent line by using this formula which is 2x minus 1, which is, we've determined is the, the formula for this parabola. And I can put in any value for x and get a y value out of it and tell you what the time rate of change is at that particular point. So um, if I put in 1, 1 times 2 is 2 minus 1 is 1. So here's 1, here's 1. So fx equals 1, boom. What's y? Well, y is 2x minus 1. 1 times 2 is 2. 1 mi 2 minus 1 is 1. Boom, here's my x. There's my point. That is why this formula works for this particular equation or this particular uh, x squared equation. So, yeah, there's a question in the chat. That, that That's where it gets a little more confusing. So, I don't expect everybody to pick that up right away because it, but if you want to try to do this on your own, I give in your homework assignment f of x, x squared. Steve, plus, can, I, can I talk yes. to you? Uh, midnight spot? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So midnight, that's an example of a relation that yeah, that's, you can easily yeah. solve this using implicit differentiation. Um, but that's another hangout. If you want, we can talk off air. But basically, you can do this in two ways. You can split them into two functions, the top half and the bottom half, and just use the formula. It's much harder that way. But it's, it's simple. You can still use the power rule. The exponent's one half. 
but there's a much easier way with it, with implicit differentiation. I can see you doing that in the chat. And that's and that's where we will be doing implicit differentiation too. Yeah, but the, we should point out at midnight that the a difference between a relationship and a function is a function always has a one to one, but a relationship doesn't. A relation it doesn't. For every member but, of the domain, there's a unique member of the range. Yep. A rule that, that assigns to every member of the domain a unique element in the range. Whereas for a circle, midnight, please verify every x value except the um, except the ones that intercept the x-axis have two partners, two y uh, values. Because you have the top hemisphere over the y and the yeah. bottom hemisphere. But at, at y, at, yeah, at, when x equals zero, um, that's is that unique? No, well, it depends. Depends how big your circle is. For example, the circle okay. radius one will touch it minus one and one, right? Right, then right. The vertical tangent lines. Yeah, so the with the radius of one, it's my negative one, one with y being one, negative one, two, right? Right, but the, the issue is minus one and one because we get vertical tangent lines there, which is a problem. Okay. Yeah, we're, and we will have another hangout. Uh, I may I may touch on it only because I'm not good at it and I want, and I should be. Oh, he's right. Midnight's right. But like, props to Midnight. He did it. Yeah, no, I mean, he, that's, he's actually solving it as a, as a differential equation almost. So um, that's, yeah, so, but yeah, no, that, but that's how, that's how you would do a, a relation, right? But I, I just, I haven't got into relations because they're not the same as functions and I haven't See, got into could, differentiation yet. You could have a lot of fun with this and this would be in your wheelhouse. You could do, you know, these cardoids in these examples where we have to use implicit functions because it's just too damn hard to use it implicitly. And then you could, I mean, you could have all sorts of fun. You could do cycloids, all sorts of neat physics stuff. That cycloids are cool. Wheelhouse. Yeah, yeah, cycloids are really cool. Um, yeah, sorry to drill. No, cycloids. I like cycloids because cycloids are you know, when you when you're tracing something for that path of the cycloid, it makes pretty cool stuff. But um, we should give Midnight Sparkle the a very like a simple differential um, equation, like a first order linear differential equation, like uh, dy dx equals minus y over x. How would you solve that Midnight using uh, separation of variables and uh, and and uh, integration? Not as hard as you think, but that's that's one that's one, probably one. One um, a differential equation that most people could probably do in their head at some point, but we'll we'll get into that another time. Okay, I think we're jumping way ahead, right? I don't know. Would you know? Can you think of a simpler differential equation than that, Eo? Because I think that's probably the the simplest possible, isn't it? Well, well, technically, the simplest differential equation is y prime equals zero. But <laughs> okay, that's trivial. <laughs> but that's a trivial case they call it. Right, so the the one they introduced Calc students to is y prime equals y, and as, as we did the other day, as we solved the other day, that's the the solution is the exponential function. Okay, but hold yeah, on, you actually raised a good point, Steve. When we get into integral calculus, you'll see basically we are solving all sorts of uh, differential equations. For example, if y prime equals two x, what's y? You go backwards and drag. Actually, drag. Let's bring drag into this. Do you have time to write that, Steve? Can you ask drag to solve that? Uh, yeah. Well, let's, well, let's just. Let's, uh, yeah, I was gonna do your your. I was gonna show your prime thing, but yeah, let's see if I can I can do here. One sec. Go ahead. Where am I writing? Y prime equals two x. Ask Drake to solve that differential equation. Y uh, prime equals two x. Let me find a pen. Uh, okay. Is it y prime equals two x? Yeah. Uh, So I usually I I I it's been so long since I've solved different equations, but I always write them in this form. But but Dreg, let me let me help you. You just this is wait 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 let me let me see. I, I want to see if I can figure it out too. So this is a separable differential, right? You can actually say you guys are making way too complicated. I, but this is how but this is how my, I, I work here. So two x two x dx. There's only one y variable. Dy. I just I just got dy d, dy over dx equals this two x. So I mean, if I take the, if I take well, the, yeah. uh, uh, what you call yeah. both, I mean, it's a dy, d out, huh? You have to integrate both sides. Yeah, so say I was gonna f, like I could take the uh, derivative of y prime, and I just have dy over dx equals two. No, so integrations. So drag now to solve differential equations. You I don't know. I don't know simple for integrate here. I haven't, so I haven't worked it yet. Look, I was just trying to make the point that. What function, if y prime equals 2x, that means that the derivative of some function, so what function is that? That's the question we're asking. You get that? Oh, oh, the integration would be the reverse. So, no, yeah, it would be like what? Uh, uh, fuck. Uh, x, uh, if, you, if you're doing it reverse, hold on, because it would be x to the second? 
Yes, you did it. And plus constant. Yeah, because we asked the second. There you go. But you got to add that constant in, remember? Plus K? What is it? Is it K? Yeah, plus K or C. Yeah, plus yeah, so integrate. So integrate two plus. It's two. It's two. So it's going to be x. Well, actually, I have to do the integration. X squared plus c. And I use. We. I usually do them this way, and I know this is kind of annoying, but I guess this. And I'll show you why I do it this way. So. Um, Steve raised a good uh, point, and when we get to that lecture, I've got a great feminist empowerment joke. Great joke. Ready when we get to that. Because there's, there are actually two different constants, right? Because each integration comes with a different constant. But th because constants can be added together, you basically can just shove them together and put um, one constant together, right? So I end up with x squared equals c. Is that right? x squared plus c. Close. X squared, cool. x squared, x squared plus c. You're right. I'm sorry. Yeah, x squared. X squared so there are other constants when you're doing it. What as is a different type well, of integration. The, no, the reason the reason I'm doing it this way, and let me show you. And by the way, did I solve this differential equation correctly? It's been a while since so I've done diffie q. Is that right, Eo? Hi. Uh, Eo, I yep. can't hear you. Okay, so yeah, so that's not bad. I haven't done diffie q in a very long time. So, but here, what what we're basically doing is we're we're basically let me, understand the... let me see if I can Go explain ahead. it because it's been a while since so I've done diffie q. I, 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 he gave us the initial thing, x, f, y prime equals 2x. What I did was, I don't like using prime notation for this. Again, this is just my personal thing when I, did, when I did differentials. I like writing it in Leibniz notation. The reason being is you can actually see at this point that these variables are what's called separable. Okay? And when you separate the variables, all I'm doing is I'm taking 2x and I'm moving it to this side of the equation. And I'm taking dy, and I'm moving it to this side. I'm separating the variables here, or Ronnie would say variables. Variables. <laughs> so, so this way, the way I'm looking, the way I do this, I, I can actually see what's going on. Okay, now I am ending up with 2x with respect to x. Now, again, don't confuse notation here that you think dx are different, or, 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 or uh, it's like two variables of x in there. It's not. What this is basically saying is dx with respect to x. Okay, and I think a lot of people might get confused. In there. Let, me, let me add a little uh, padding in here so you can actually see that. Because okay, it's actually with respect to x. Don't, don't think this is 2x times d times x. It doesn't work that way. Okay, so now I guess I, I've separated the variables. Now I'm going to integrate both sides. And that's with this little sigma here. And you can actually put a, this is called an indefinite um, integration. You can actually put limits from the top to bottom, boundary conditions, I think they're called, right, of the, uh, the indices. Um, so I'm now I'm integrating 2x. Now this what I'm doing now is I'm just doing the reverse of the power rule, right? So I'm I'm taking the coefficient, I'm moving to the exponent x squared, but I also am adding a constant to it because um, when you do an integration, you, you you're doing a general form. There's going to be a range of form. You're doing. Sorry, a, Steve. You meant uh, to write. You meant to write x squared plus c1 equals y plus c2, and then you can combine the x squared and. A sink into a single constant on the left-hand side. So you, you screwed up there with the. C oh, oh, yeah, oh, you're right. You're right. Right. I, I, I see exactly what I did wrong. Y is y plus c two, and then I just, I just change. I just put a padding here, but this Hawk is actually y. Hogtie champ, do you want to link in? Because Hogtie's in the outside chat. So, I know he Drake, likes math. Drake, can I tell you why we need the constants, buddy? Can you imagine the y equals x squared parabola? Y equals x squared. Like? Yes, yeah, a big, uh, not a hoop or a loop or um, yeah. like a u. Can, now, can you imagine we can shift that up and down any way we want? The tangent lines are the same. Do you get that? Right. Because because whatever x whatever I say, if I say x squared plus two, right? I'm just moving that parabola. What happens to the derivative of a constant? It goes to zero, right? So this is a general solution set. This is saying that this x squared plus constant is a general solution because I don't know what my initial was. I could have x squared plus five, and what's the derivative? Two x, right? What's the derivative of x squared plus? Any constant, 2x. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's a derivative. So this is just giving me this is giving me a general solution set. That's all it's doing. I love. I know that's where a lot of people get confused, isn't it, you? Because they're not understanding that that the, you, you when you're doing an integration, you're you're giving a general formula that applies to a lot of different cases because. I could I could take the derivative of x squared. I get x two x. If I take the derivative of x squared plus five, I also get two x. You don't and, know what you don't know field, what Steve, um, 
your field is physics, you know. Well, it's I, it's really not though. I wish you would. My physics was not field. I, I I was trained to learn how to operate the power plant. I just had to learn physics and science in order to do that. But my training was specifically more in operations. Well, so I don't want people to think that I have a background in physics because when I actually try to do a physics problem, I suck at it. I just understand concepts. But the point I was trying to make is often with these differential equations applications, we get, you know, field lines and isoclines and we get different. And so it's really important to represent, you know, entire fields with, with the equation. And then we choose a specific trajectory. Um, long story short, Drake, if you don't include the constant, your teacher will dock you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, I do wrong. remember that. Yeah, because it's wrong. But I will tell you a story. I will tell you a story a long time ago. We used to have in, in our work, when I worked at Kohl's, um, we had this white, you know, those big white memo papers that people use. They're like huge things, like for like charts, right? Just massive pieces of white folded, uh, white um, graphing thing, and you write on it when you're doing a presentation, something like that. You know what I'm talking about? Like an easel? Yeah, like an easel. So there's this, you know, it's like, you know, three feet across or three feet high, whatever. And we would, ask, and one of the things that we would do is ask random questions on that thing, and just kind of a trivia type thing, right? Well, somebody who had a degree in mechanical engineering, so I'd be a wise ass, and he wrote, um, you know, find the uh, derivative to uh, it was like e to the x three x plus four or something, something, something along those lines, right? Well, back then I kind of actually remember more than I did now, and I just I was like looking in, and, and I I literally solved it on the thing, and. My manager, one of my manager came in. The guy, the only manager that I didn't like, right? Well, well, because there was two, but one that I just couldn't stand. The guy was, guy, this was an idiot. And he comes in like, well, how'd you know how to do that? I'm like, Jesus Christ. I'm like, you really think I'm a dumbass, don't you? And, but, but everybody, but, but it was really cool because like, it was like a hum, well, good little hunting moment, you know? Like, oh yeah, I think I know how to remember how to solve this kind of shit. <laughs> and he was just like blown away. He's like, I didn't know you knew any of that stuff. I'm like, well, you don't know any about oh. me because you're an idiot and I don't want to talk to you. Had moments like that uh, when I worked for uh, Lowe's uh, a few months ago, because they were trying to figure out how to get a bag of chips to fall and knock down. Because you know, you the vending machine gets the gets shit shit in there gets stuck, right? And so I told them is they were trying to figure out which thing to choose that will knock it down. I said, well, you would want to choose the thing higher up because it had more potential energy than anything closer to it. So you would want to choose the uh, the Cheetos up there, even though the one that you're looking at looks like it's a bit heavier, it wouldn't be able to push it with enough force because it has less potential energy from the fall. So you ideally, you want to go with something higher up so it can have more potential energy that can actually hit it with enough force to knock it loose. And so you get two for the price of one. Like gravity That's do the work for you, right? Yeah, and so I, I sat there and explained it to people, just looking at me like I was had a dick on my forehead. I was like, "It's true." <laughs> like I could show you mathematically why that's true. And so, yeah, well, it's just little funny stuff like that. I gotta tell you, I'm actually kind of thrilled with myself that I remember how to do a differential equation. So, whatever. Um, I wasn't expecting to do different Q yet. But anyways, let's let's, let's continue on because I, I really go wanna... ahead and invite uh, Hog Tie. He's he'll he'll be AFK. I think he said he wants to come in for for a little bit. Sure, let's get Hog Tie in here. Why not? Um, there you go, Hogtai. Um, Hogtai should be giving these lectures. He knows calculus really well. Um, like I said, I'll, I'll, I'll sit through a lecture from Hogtai or I'll sit through a lecture from Ronnie. I, I really, I'd be down for either one. But okay, so let's let's actually show um, your 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 um, your picture here. So let me actually go to my my thing here. Oh, he did a great job on that expected value of that game. I caught that lecture. That was amazing, and I was. I was shopping at a mall, and I really wanted to jump in that lecture. But yeah, that was amazing with the expected value. It was great. What what, what was it for? What game? Drake, was Steve not there at that lecture? Do you remember that hangout? You had yeah, it was a uh, it was the one where um, he uh, you pay him two dollars, and then he flips a coin, and then uh, it's it, I forget. You know, like yeah, it's 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 the same game that he um that he told you about uh, way back when because he the the idea is that. The, the the trick overall is that if you play the game infinitely, you're always going to come on out on top. Uh, so, uh, like I, I, I forgot what the ideal amount. Of, I don't know if you if you bet an infinite amount of dollars, you'll come out on. Oh top. yeah 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 yeah. That's, that's right yeah yeah because and and then I guess the the solution to that is you should always play regardless of the amount. Yeah. Yeah, I forget what the name of the game was. That is called. Yeah, he, oh, there's a name for it. And I can't remember for the life of me. Uh, you have to come in and tell me. I, I honestly don't remember. I've heard it before, before even Hogtime mentioned it, but I, I didn't remember the details on it. But I did look back into it when he um, he mentioned it. 
like I can't, it's called this something freaking a yeah I, I, I can't remember on my head are you gonna jump into the power wheel proof see if I may have paid yeah yeah let me see I'm just trying to, to wait my, my computer's being sluggish just somebody leveling from level 1 to 110 and wow without sleeping jeez okay let me see if I can hop on my phone because I need to take a bath because I do have class tomorrow <sighs> da, da, da. my computer's being really really buggish here so I gotta get into where you you put that picture oh and the hangout yeah I mean does, does the do you think we should bother or just kind of look at it real quick because because there is a proof out there of why the power rule works based upon first principles and you can actually plug and chug and and do that proof and eo has done a more elegant version of it here we go where he um he used by bi uh, binomial notation which is a much simpler way of, of doing it but when you actually have to do this in college uh you have to write the whole thing out it was, it was when i did it so i can't find where you put this eo what 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 um can I you really this? Yeah, this? if you want we can do it today but you want to just do this next time and then we can use it for any exponent real exponents up to you um you're feeling up to no, it. Go ahead. No, no. Let's finish it up. Let's just see. Let's just show you. Show them the picture real quick. I'm just remember where. Where'd you put the what? What I am? Did you pick the picture? The the chat. The what do you call it, Drake? Is it the external chat? The one. Yeah, the but which? Off? Oh, here you go. I found it. I found it. A lot of external chats. Okay, so I found it. We're gonna be showing it one second here. Dun dun dun. And what will be fun is I did this in a couple of minutes, folks. So please check my arithmetic. I could be off on some of my arithmetic. Yeah, I'm not going to bother checking this for you, to be honest. But but I mean the concept. I mean the concept is legit because I was looking at the actual proof. This is very very similar to the proof that I was going to use. The only difference is I didn't use a shorthand notation, and so you have to actually write the shit out, and it's just it's just whatever. But basically, what he's saying here, I'm going to try to read through this. Um, he's saying. Uh, Left let n equals uh, x to the n. Um, see, n is an element of natural for any number for natural numbers for the set of natural numbers. Yep. One so n is, one is, n is three, okay. Four, this notation five. here is called element. So he's saying that n is an element of natural numbers. So n is a natural number. Whenever you see that that type of symbology, um, f of x the limit goes to this is the standard formula for what we just went over. He's he's putting in. Um, uh, the x to the n here, so basically x to the n, and remember, we just put x plus h where n is here, right? So we end up with x plus h to the n minus x to the n over h. This is all easy so far, right? Now, when you expand all this stuff out, okay, you got now you're dealing with n, though. You, if you, here's the problem that, that people make it into. X plus H squared, we know the binomial expansion for that because we've done that before, right? We just did it in the hangout we just had. Everybody agree? But now he's using for any N of an element of natural numbers. So now it could be any N there is. And so now you have to account for that. That's where you use this binomial expansion, this huge, big old long thing, because this will work for any N. It'll, it'll collapse down to any N. Um, is that the best way to describe it? I guess you know, but you're using a short. You're using a notation that I I, I remember, but I don't remember the n over uh, zero, yeah, so the n over n, one. That's n choose zero. In other words, how many ways can I? Do n choose zero. That's what it is. N choose zero. Yeah. Okay. Combinatorial I notation. Now. Not permutation. It's, I remember it as k, uh, k n over k. Yep. Yeah, n choose k. Sorry. Yeah. No, not over. N choose k. N choose k. Yeah, yeah. Combination. Oh, you, oh, you have it right in the middle here. Yeah. N choose k. So this is basically. Um, well, you know what you described. I, by, this, is, this whole choosing thing, I get. I've done it with permutations and combinations. Let me just, it's really simple, guys. How many ways can I choose in total? Well, once. How many ways can I choose? So let's take at our fingers. We have five fingers. How many ways can I choose one finger? That's five, choose one, and the answer is five. Everybody still with me? In general, the answer is n factorial over n minus r factorial divided by r factorial, where r is what you're choosing, or k if you like, whatever. In other words, it's the coefficients for all of the middle terms are the hard part, and that's what algebra students hate, and it's a convenient way of writing it out. Okay, so the 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 n plus uh, n raised to the n, x raised to the n plus x raised to the n minus one, all all the way dot dot dot. So it's going to be n minus any value, which is going to be, we're going to call k. Okay, so this 
basically works for any value. Um, this is this is forget the whole binomial theorem there for just a second. I mean, because again, that gets into a little more complex. You think it's simple, but I, this whole n choose k does is confusing. I I I never liked it so. I'm not the one. How did you guys do it? Did you use did you use factorials then? No, I, yeah, we used factorials. Like it was like k over n plus k factorial, or something along those lines. Right. To be fair, though, I just I had no idea you'd be presenting this. I just wrote this out for Dragon in a couple of minutes because I wanted to see it. But we wrote it. We we did the thing long way, long you know you know nasty hand. Um, this this whole way of writing it in this n choose k, I was familiar with, but I never was comfortable using it ever. So I'm just I'm not going to go there. But let's just let's just move on. Um, the, the binomial expansion collapses down. Basically, is all he's saying is it's collapsing it all down. He starts canceling things out, and he ends up with basically the first term here, which is n x raised to the n minus one, and because everything else gets gets um, reduced to zero as as h goes to zero. That's basically and, what you're doing, right? And just like all of Steve's examples, please note what Steve's pointing to there with his cursor is the only term that doesn't involve an h. So everything else is going to collapse except that first term, just like in all of Steve's proofs, by the way. Yeah, that, that's that's a, that's a good point. Um, because every one of these terms has an H in it, it doesn't even matter, I think, if you get the binomial expansion correct. It, they're all going to go away anyways. As long as you have the first term in there, it doesn't have an H value. It's not going to be affected, right? Uh, but uh, Right, and that's the reason. Hold on, Dre, can you see now? That's the reason the derivative of X to the N is N times X to the N minus 1 because everything else has an H term and collapses. Do you see that, buddy? Yeah, because what he well, I'm, all he I'm did. I'm listening. All, I'm, I'm about to take a bath. Okay, go go take your bath. You know, display some water. Go do Archimedes' principle. But what, one thing I should note here that we kind of skipped: the way he was able to cancel out what h in the denominator is, he factored out an h from every term in the top. And by factoring out an h in every term in the top, this left this term n x uh, raised to the negative one without an h because he, this h got drawn out. This h got drawn out. All these h got drawn out or subtracted, right? So I mean, and it, it, if you have nx nx h squared, you'll then have nx nx h, right? So there's a there's an h taken out from every one of these terms. But when you take an h out of this term, what happens? There's no more h. So that's why he was able to to factor out this h, cancel it with the denominator, take the limit at h bro to zero. These all go away. Bam. You're left with nx minus nx raised to the nx minus one, and so now we have we have we can you can use this now. So if I say x squared, what's the derivative of x squared using the power rule? Okay, well n is equal to two. That's that you got to remember that n is the element of all natural numbers, right? So two is a natural number. So two minus one is one, and then you take two and you put it where the coefficient is here, and x, which is the coefficient. I end up with two x raised to the first, which is 2x. So this is why that works. Now, it should be pointed out that because n is an element of natural numbers, you can't use the power rule for negative um, exponents, correct? No, it gets, yeah, you know, well. No, There's some limitation there. Again, I don't, I, 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 I try. No, Steve, it works for. Does it work for negative? For every, remember the derivative of 1 over x is minus 1 over x squared. Yeah. yeah. It works okay, squared. wait, so, wait, okay. Um, does it work for zero? Well, that's a trivial question because anything raised to the zero power is one. Well, right? yeah, so right, right, right. But that's what I'm saying. The reason why we have to clarify n as a natural number is that because zero is not considered a natural number in this particular instance. No, honestly, the only reason we clarify natural numbers here is that exponents are a couple of chapters ahead. We're starting at basics. This proof works, and if you see the other attachment, we can use logarithms or implicit differentiation to prove this for any exponent, okay. any real exponent. Okay. I mean, I can always kind of wonder that when it comes to like real analysis that uh, I could stop sharing, sharing. Um, why they choose, and you could probably answer this question to help for me. Why do they choose um, n is an element of n, vice n is an element of z? Because we're dealing with integers, or natural numbers, they're the same. Starting with the basics. It's baby steps. We that's the next thing to do. Remember, we do, we take the derivative of square roots, we take the derivative of reciprocals, but we do that after polynomials because polynomials are the easiest critters. They're friendly. Um, historically, it's always been done that way in, in the math books because wait a minute, wanna, but, I, but see, here's what I don't understand. But if, if n is an element of n, natural numbers are, are are z plus, right? Natural numbers are the positive integers, correct? They are, but this proof, this particular proof, doesn't work for anything but the natural. Oh, 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 okay, 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 I get it. Okay, okay, 
Totally get it now. But, so, but, here's this, the but this particular proof, now you're saying n, you're only using n as an element of the natural numbers. Because I had to use the binomial theorem. Before. You saw that, right? Binomial theorem. I get it. I totally get it now. Yeah. I there totally is, get there it. are okay. versions of binomial theorem for negative exponents, but they're a little more complicated. See, that that would be I, – I would really have like to have it hang out on that topic. We like, have to use series and sequence and stuff. It's a lot more complicated. But, yeah, we can do that if you'd like. Well, I mean, like, on, on like, what's, what's, what are integers? What are rational numbers? What are irrational numbers? What are transcendental numbers? Oh, I'd love to do that. Transcendental algebraic numbers? numbers. You can't, uh, by the way, you can't be transcendental without being irrational first. How's that for a line? You, you can't be transcendental without being irrational first. Chew on that. Uh, all, rash, all transcendental numbers are irrational. That's right. So to become a transcendental, you first have to be irrational. I didn't know. I, uh, why can't you just say you? Def oh, okay. Well, there's a religious yeah. parallel there. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it doesn't work the other way around because obviously not all. It, right. And actually, did, can we make a parallel? Um, people struggle with this. All Ferraris are cars, but not all cars are Ferraris. Ferraris are special cars. Yeah. Transcendentals are special irrationals. Right. Right. They're a subset right. of irrational of rationals, and irrationals are a subset of the reals, and the reals are a subset of the complex, and the complex are a subset of the. I'm going to say, is it the hyperreals? I just go up to complex numbers, but you get the point. People often yeah. have a few subsets. And it's all about logic. And I'm hoping you do it. I'm hoping, and I want to say this as diplomatically as I can. I'd like to teach people what contradictions mean, because what I've watched in the last several hangouts, people seem really resistant to the idea of what a contradiction well, why is. Don't you, why don't you do a presentation on it then? See, I mean, you could easily, here's the thing. Anybody could do a presentation on stuff they know. You could easily do a math presentation. One thing that is I like the great debate community like this is that, I like to do presentations that I'm something I'm not that I'm not an expert in, right? I, li I like having lay people come in and, and present something and see if they can understand it and be able to explain it to other people. I find that to be great. And now it's great for an expert to come in too. Don't get me wrong, but I got to tell you, a lot of experts in our community, when I listen to them, some of them might be like, "Yeah, this is explained really well." I get. It. And other ones, I'm like, "I have no idea what the hell you just said," and I'm, it's not explained properly, right? And well, if you have a second. Let's just do a simple one. Okay. There's three and not three. Does everyone in the chat get that? So if I say that Steve has $3, he, if I then say he has $4, that's a contradiction. Now, in real life, we can see it's an approximation, but here's the point. If I say, let's say, let's pick one at random, a certain king takes power at 22 years old, and then I tell you he takes power at 42 years old, it's a contradiction. It's true or not, there was such a king. But the point is, 22 and 42 are different numbers. Therefore, it's a contradiction. Yes. And you can't finesse that. You can't, you can't finesse that. You can't resolve that. You, you could resolve it possibly, but the point is, uh, from a purely logical point of view, it's a contradiction. And, and saying something to the contrary is just wrong. Well, did you see how I wrote that down mathematically in that one post? Did you, did you see my post on that? I did, yeah, I did. Well, I, broke, I broke it down for G-Man. And I said, look it, you know, here, this is equal to this, equal to this. Here's the logic. What's wrong with it? Was, was, my, was my reasoning pretty good on that? I did, and that was fine. And it's really contentious. I was just talking to Steve off air about this. If I – anyway, we should leave theology to another hangout. Sorry. Yeah, oh, yeah. So, yeah, we're going to be we're gonna be dropping out here soon. But, uh, yeah, if you guys got – in the live chat, you guys have suggestions of things that we, you know, want to do to, – to, Hangouts on. Um, I'm down for that. I don't mind relearning something or even learning something new to try to be able to explain it. Uh, again, this is not for me being some professor or mathematician. This is just me showing that I understand this and able to explain it oh, and enjoying it. Oh, oh, is Kenny still in the chat? There's I don't know. Something Kenny's still that in the chat. he mentioned in G Man's Hangout that we were all of what, 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 fuck, what? It was something quantum. Something retro causality. Oh, quant quantum, something. No, it's called it's called quantum retro retro causality. Okay, whatever the hell that is, we need to do a hangout on that because nobody, everyone oh, was like, God. "What in the um, hell is that?" Quantum. Drake, okay, it's it a legit thing. Quantum retro causality is how something in the present time can affect something in the past time. It's retroactive. It's retro causational. However, there and, and, there is such a thing a famous, that exists. There's a famous Christian apologist called Richard Swinburne who's adopted that. So it isn't. Um, Kenny's a bright guy, but it isn't new to Kenny. Um, several Christian apologists have already taken that tack. And Drake, do you know yeah. why they do it? It's a way of ex keeping Adam and Eve and death before the fall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I and I get why they're doing it. I, I understand that argument. It's it's, a, it's kind of a nuanced argument, but I, I understand that. But there is something to be said for retrocausation, right? Um, there, when when Richard Feynman 
did his lectures, one of the things he, he postulated was that during a pair production, you have a positron created and you have an electron created. They are the same particle, only opposite charge, right? But they're also tem t uh, temporally different. One is going forward in time and one is going backwards in time. But they annihilate each other so quickly that, if I'm not mistaken, you might be able to correct me, but I believe it's within a Planck's time. You can't even tell that that pair was ever there. There's no way to even know that a pair was produced. And these these particles are constantly creating these pairs, constantly creating these pair reductions over and over and over again, just a, you know, infinite amount of time. One way the electrons going forward, one way the positrons are going back, and they basically say night each other before they even even came to being kind of thing. There's a retro causation that exists there. Right, but let's be clear, and correct me if I'm wrong, Steve, this is an alternative to the Copenhagen interpretation. Let's be clear. Yeah, yeah, it, I don't think it's compatible with the Copenhagen interpretation. Yeah. No, in fact, it was created as an alternative because as you yeah, know, yeah. we know the Schrodinger wave function works, but we can't explain why it works. And this is one way to try to help resolve that. Lamette says it's wrong, and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure why he thinks it's wrong. The effect before the cause, yeah, well, that's... But there is there there is a way in, in the people have used quantum retrocausation to try to affect temporally things in the past. Now I don't believe that's possible, right? But they have used that, Lamed. Um, Sci-fi is one of the, the the mechanisms by which they 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 invoke in order to have temporal changes in the past. But you're right; the effect is before the cause on causal retrocausality. This is one of the things that they apply invoke in the quantum eraser experiment, right? Which I think is just completely misleading. Like quantum eraser loves, qu you know, quoting the quantum eraser experiment. It's a very, very complex experiment. I don't even full, I don't even grasp the experiment that much. Um, but I don't think it has the implications that quantum erasers implying with it. You know. But uh, let's see here. You do the entanglement before you decide to measure. Well, that's for certain cases, but obviously. With the retro causality of the pair anti pair creation, you don't do you're not digging any measurement. You're not you're not they're automatically entangled, but you're not you're not entangling them, but you can. I mean, obviously we do things all the time like that. We entangle things and then you you isn't, see if, what's that? Isn't the standard experiment with the calcium ions split out two photons with opposite spin, I wanna say? I thought but it was cesium. It, it could be, but um, my understanding the quantum eraser experiment is the following with the spin at the beginning and at the last second you pull out the detector so that you get interference pattern you get wave-like behavior instead of particle behavior um, yeah well it's yeah. okay yeah, I, I was gonna say see it's season for the atomic clocks yeah maybe you're right for the calcium for the the quantum ra eraser experiment yeah you change you change something and you change it so such that the life path wouldn't have time to go back and change its path because it's already decided to go one path and but it still as it produces an interference pattern rather than not or the other way around but Basically, you're changing something such that you, it should. Once the path, once the light has chosen a path, it shouldn't matter what you've done in the in the beginning part of the path, so right? Here's the point: if you if you if you try to detect it or observe it, you're going to get particular behavior. But if you don't observe or detect it, you're going to get constructive interference, right, or destructive interference, depending on what happens. Constructive or destructive interference. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very yeah. If somebody wants to do an actual hangout. Or a lecture on the quantum eraser experiment. I'm down for that because again, I know very, very little about it. Just as much as what EO said. Basically, you're changing something conditional wise after let's the light has Lamed done something, let's, and you're still let's getting. Let's defer to Lamed, but my understanding of retrocausation is basically an alternative school to the Copenhagen interpretation. Like that's yeah, I thought so too. Right? So there, there's and so is hidden variable. Or excuse me, the multi multi world hypothesis. That's in in yes. contradiction to the what Copenhagen. Was the, one, the Bohm, the Bohm. Bo uh, you don't, uh, Brogier de Baume? Yeah, yeah, yeah de Broly. And so um, I just want to add to this point that, anyway, this is far beyond me, Steve. You should, yeah, that's, pi that's called pilot wave theory. Yeah, that's way beyond the scope. The pilot wave theory deals with, with how to get around the problem with hidden variables, by, by, but you lose locality. It has to do with local realism. Again, we're way the hell out of, uh, out of the... But wait, uh, isn't it well established we lost locality anyway? Isn't that what Bell discovered in the 70s? Well, what Bell, Bell's inequality is basically saying that you can never have a quantum mechanical system that satisfies the conditions where you, um, that you can have both local and realism at the same time, I believe. Um, right, uh, Einstein believed in hidden variables. Didn't Bell show him wrong that basically those? those yeah, no, Einstein did believe in hidden variables. Yeah. Very, <laughs> Einstein 
wanted there to be hidden variables, but but the bell inequality says that hidden variables cannot exist. That you can never have a hidden variable model, hidden variable model that satisfies all possible conditions that explains all possible quantum states. Why are you making me go into this? I haven't looked at this stuff in ages. It was brought up in the chat. I didn't you're, know. you're sharpshooting me, aren't you? You see? No, no, Drake. No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. kidding. Thank you so much. No, thank you, thank you, Eo. Um, you know what? I'm just, I'm just glad that I actually know a little bit about these topics. I, I'm so, you know, when when they start talking about their biology stuff, guys, it's like uh, I get, I'm like, I love biology, but half the time I don't know what the hell they're talking about. I'm just riding along when they're going into their very in depth stuff. So, you know, I like a lot of different subjects. I do read more than people think I do, but. Anyways, thanks for watching, guys. Um, if you guys got any questions about these first principles, um, let me know. Let EO know. Let Drag know. And if you got something you want us to do, let me know. I'm going to be trying to do something on matrix theory coming up. Uh, but before we do matrix, I might do one or two other ones of just, you know, of interest. Just something because again, I wanted to kind of do this in steps. That's why I was like, let's let's do linear equations. Let's do order of operations. Let's do um, um, basic derivatives. I mean, let's. Get some of this out of the way before I start tackling some of the other stuff. Because as we learned, precept upon precept. And you can't just like jump in with by using, oh, let's just do the power rule and I know calculus. No, it doesn't work that way. But um uh okay, so anyways, guys, I'm ending this and midnight sparkle. Thanks for listening. Lamed, thank you as always, and thank you for all the support you do for my channel. Um I I, I am might be putting you had asked me before about putting up an Amazon wish list. I may put something up there just um Something really inexpensive, but I don't know what I'm looking for. I'm looking for something that people have asked me to get where I can write on a tablet, a little, just a little piece of shit thing that you write on it and it actually shows on the screen. So when I cross things out or I circle things or I can draw on it, it shows up. And I think they're called, um, I can't remember the name. Uh, they're not, they're, they're not that much, but, but, uh, but since you've asked me very kindly to put it on the wish list, uh, you know, you know. Lamette has been very supportive of my channel. He's like one of my, my big supporters, and I, and I thank him very kindly from the bottom of my heart for, for all he's done. Uh, again, my ass thanks thanks him for him because my back hurts, and that's one of the reasons why I'm just I'm just probably not sounding coherent is my back really hurts, guys. But anyways, thanks for watching, and I'm out.